I'd like to thank you all for coming out and joining us tonight for our financial aid presentation. We're lucky to have Mr. Bill Spires with us. Bill is a financial aid officer from Tallahassee Community College. He's been a friend of Bishop Kenny for many years, and um, we're definitely fortunate to have him here. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Spires, and thank you again for coming. Good evening and thank you for being here and thank those of you who are joining us by uh, live stream tonight. We're glad that we're able to meet the needs of those who are willing to come in person and those who need to view us over the camera tonight. I have been coming to Bishop Kenny a long time, uh, actually over 30 years to be exact. Uh, I've been in financial aid 38 years and I've been coming here probably 34 or 35 of those. So it's good to be back with my friends here at Bishop Kenny, and we're going to try to move through this as clearly as possible. Normally, through the process, I take questions and let you ask questions. If we could hold the questions tonight until the very end because of us recording and, and going on camera, I think it'll be a tad more efficient and more beneficial to those who have joined us by live stream. Well, Financial Aid 101. Here you are, mom and dad. How many of you, this is your first child going off to college? Yep, not easy, let me tell you. Hardest part is the first day if they go out of town when you leave them on campus. Uh, it's, it's just a different experience. I have three kids, one of them went out of town and it was difficult. But the second most difficult part is probably figuring out how you're going to finance this new adventure that you've embarked on. And that's what we're here for tonight. And so we're going to get started and move through this as quickly as possible. So the first question most of you want to know is who pays for higher education? Well, to the extent possible, mom and dad, you, the student, you're the primary people responsible for paying for higher education. When you can't do that, that's where... Financial aid steps in, but the primary rep, uh, responsibility rests with the family. And if the family needs help, then federal government, state government steps in with the various resources they have available, and they use a federally determined needs analysis system that determines how much you're going to contribute. Interesting thing is, that is in the process of changing. And we haven't seen all of the changes yet, but we're going uh, from the expected family contribution to an expected family contribution and a student aid index. So we're waiting to see all of that right now. And how much is the family expected to contribute? Well, I tell every group, this process was developed by the U.S. Congress back in the 1990s. So it was developed by the Congress. So what does that tell you? It's always going to be more than you think that you actually can, right? So that's how much that is expected. But all schools use the same federal methodology to determine how you will receive federal financial aid. It is not determined by the school's choice, but by the formula that's set aside by the U.S. Department of Education. Included in the uh, contribution for a dependent is the student's income, the student's assets, and the student's untaxed income where appropriate. From the parents, we're going to look at your income, we're going to look at your assets, and where appropriate, untaxed income. The, we will also look at all prepaid programs, 529 programs, that you own for all children. And by the way, the student that's going off to school now, you want to list their prepaid under your area. I can assure you it's treated better. So make sure you do, because otherwise you can rule out anything otherwise, because they take about 50% of what the value is. So make sure that you do that. 
We look at the number of family members. How many is in the family? Because that tells us how much we need to set aside for other expense. The number in college excluding parents. And I want you to take note of that because I'm going to come back to it. We look at the age of the older parent. Anybody want to guess why we look at the age of the older parent? The older you are, the closer you are to retirement and they protect more and more of your income and assets. So it's a retirement issue when you look at that. Then we can look at other items under professional judgment. Understand that not all schools will look at the same items, but these are items we can look at. Uh, one of those we can look at is parents in college. We can put you back in. If you're at least half time, six hours, we can put you back into the formula. Some schools will do it, others won't. You have to ask. So check with the school that you choose, your child chooses to attend to see if they will. If you have other children in private education, we can put the expense of that private education back in as an income reducer. Some schools will, some schools won't. At my school we will, at, um, and I, I'm not demeaning them, but the University of Florida will not. Uh, their director and I've talked about that. We disagree, so we, we argue about it. I think they should. Uh, any change in the family's financial circumstance, we can look at. This is particularly important over about the last two years with the advent of COVID. Many parents have either had a reduction in income or a loss of job. And we can go back and look at that and we can reduce the income under professional judgment. You have to document it, but we can do that. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Department of Education mandated that we send a notice to all of our students this year telling them about professional judgment so that they knew, know about the process and can file the appropriate uh, paperwork if they deem it appropriate. So that's where we are right now. We have all kinds of options available to us. Make sure you use any of them that will benefit you. The difference between a dependent student and an independent student is the fact that an independent student's information will not include parental information. Mom and dad do not get excited about that because I'll pop your bubble in just a few minutes. So just be prepared moving forward. How is need determined? We take the cost of education, we uh, subtract the expected family contribution, and that gives us need. Now that is the nutshell view. I promise you the, farm, the formula is far more complex than anything that I've indicated here. So just keep that in mind. I always tell people it's a regression analysis formula, and in the old days we had big charts that we put out on our desk and we would calculate it going through the entire formula and come up with your need. We can still do that, but today we usually use a computer instead. The cost of education includes tuition fees, room, board, books, transportation, and personal expense. Notice it's an inclusive budget. We're not just talking about tuition and fees and the books, it's everything that it costs a student to go to a college or university. So we look at all of these items. The important facts about the cost of education is it varies by school. And let me assure you it does. Uh, if you look locally, just to give you an idea, you have three different kinds of schools locally. I'm a graduate of Jacksonville University. Well, when I went to JU, it was pretty cheap. But today, it's somewhere over $40,000. If you look at Florida State College, Jacksonville, their average budget's going to be about, and this is an inclusive budget, tuition, fees, room, board, books, transportation, personal expense. At Florida State College, Jacksonville, it's about $14,000. If you look at UNF, it's about $22,000, give or take. You know, it varies by year, but that gives you an idea. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to go up to a seminar at Yale University and spent a few days up there. Yale University is trending towards $70,000 a year. 
before you write them off, remember that if they, you show that you're a middle-income family, they'll pay your tuition for you. So never write a school off. See what their offers are. But it does, the cost of education varies by school. Private education, always more uh, costly than public education. You can count on that. The cost of education covers some, but not all of a student's true personal expense. I can promise you that uh, the personal expense item is designed for the bare minimum. Such things as laundry detergent, soap, deodorant, probably the most important things, mom and dad, that's probably important to you, was with my kids, I know. And these are the things it's designed to cover, and then every now and then a pizza. That's why they called us poor, struggling college students, because we never had any money. I always tell the audiences, when I was in college, they had Angelo's Restaurant on University Boulevard. Somebody, you're shaking your head, did you know them? When I was, when I was in school, you could go up there and get lasagna, a salad, and iced tea for $1.99. Does that give you any idea how long ago that was? But it was good, too. Uh, the cost of education does not determine affordability. It is a determinant, but not the determinant. Encourage your students to apply the, to the schools of their dreams. You never know what kind of scholarships or grants they're going to receive. The only way you find out is by applying. I can tell you, uh, my son decided he wanted to go out of state uh, for the first part of his education and went to Ole Miss. And basically they covered all of his tuition. Made it very affordable. So look around, see what it'll cost, see what you can get. The expected family contribution is called EFC. Now I'm going to be changing this slide next year. This is one of those things in transition because I'll also be saying the student aid index starting next year, which will determine um, the amount of funds other than Pell Grant. The EFC will remain with the Pell Grant. Now, I know that sounds confusing. It is to me, so I know it would be to you. So we're still walking through that muddy water. But the expected family contribution is basically telling you the amount your family is expected to contribute towards your student's education. It is a constant. It does not change based on the cost of education. So if it's $1,000 at Florida State College Jacksonville, it's $1,000 at Yale University, it's $1,000 at University of Miami or the University of Florida. Does not change. It's always more than you feel you can contribute, I can promise that. But it's the best device we have to determine need and distribute aid equi equitably across the students. There's five things I want you to remember tonight. Remember to apply, apply early, follow up, communicate, and watch out for the scams. Apply for scholarships. Uh, scholarships are not limited to the academic elite. There's scholarships out there for all kinds of reasons. Our director of our foundation likes to remind people that she gets scholarships for people with a certain color of hair or a certain color of eyes. It will surprise you, left-handed, right-handed. So you have to look. If you're gonna look for scholarships, use free sources only. Anytime somebody starts to charge you for this part of the process, walk away. They're a crook. I know of no other way to put it. They want to take your money. But look at the library downtown. Uh, I don't know the name of the new library. It used to be the Hayden Burns Library. Have they changed the name? I don't know. I know the library. I know where it is, but I don't know the name. But go to the public library. They have a section on scholarships. The community. Look at the Kiwanis Club, the Rotary Club, the Knights of Columbus. The list goes on and on and on and on. Look at all of these places. Mom and Dad, look where you work. You never know. Look where the student works. A lot of times these employers will have scholarships. My daughter worked for Chick-fil-A. They offered a scholarship, 
but you had to have $1,000 and she left Chick-fil-A at 900 hours. I wasn't happy about that, but she was happy about it. So what can I say? Chick-fil-A, Burger King even offers scholarships. Publix, Winn-Dixie. It would surprise you what's out there. The financial aid office at the school you plan on attending, they may have their uh, scholarships outsourced to departments, but they can direct you where you need to go. And then right here at the guidance office at Bishop Kenny, make sure they go to the guidance office not once, but on a regular basis. If they went last week and looked for scholarships and they didn't have anything and they don't go back this week, they're probably missing something because almost every week at this time of the year, they're getting new scholarships in. And then the internet. There's a bunch of free resources on the internet. Use those resources. Do not pay for any part of the process. Use free sources only. Every now and then you'll run across one. Now, if you apply for our scholarship, you will get a $300 uh, scholarship. We guarantee you if you use our process. How are you going to prove that you did everything that they said you needed to do? You can't. It's a scam, so stay away from it. It's like those people that call me every night wanting to sell me auto uh, warranties. The ones I like are they call and tell me they're the IRS. That's a fun one. I can tell you a funny story what I did to those people one night. Kept them on the phone for over an hour. So I had, a, I had my one free night and I aggravated those people for an hour because they aggravated me. So I hate it when people lie, don't you? I re and I don't like people to take advantage of people. Apply for financial aid. You have to use the free application for federal student aid. You're going to do that online. Tonight I'm going to walk through the paper application with you only because I can go over every question on the form. Uh, to do that, you need to sign it electronically, which means you need a federal ID. One parent needs a federal ID. Every student needs their own federal ID. Mom and dad, if you have a federal ID from a previous student, you don't need to get another ID. That one will work. Or if you have an ID because you're in college, that's the same ID that you'll use here. So one parent has to have a federal ID, every student. So remember to get that ID. You can go home and do that tonight in a matter of minutes and have that ready to go for October 1st. Uh, some schools have their own institutional application. They are sort of a rarity now, but some schools do find out. They may, that may help you with some of their internal funding. The state of Florida application, I promise you, I know the counseling staff here at Bishop Kinney, and they will make sure that your sons and daughters complete that state application because that's how you access Bright Futures and all of the other small scholarships offered by the state of Florida. But you need to make sure they do that. And some of you will be going to schools that require the college board profile. The college, if you think the FAFSA is intrusive, wait till you get to the college board profile. They make you answer far more questions than the FAFSA ever thought about. And schools cannot use this for the distribution of federal aid. It can only be used for the distribution of their internal aid. So keep that in mind. But they'll want you to fill it in and it is onerous. I can promise you, you have to pay to submit it uh, but a lot of good schools require it from uh, George Washington to Duke University to uh, you name it. Uh, Rollins requires it. There's just a long list of schools. And again, it's for their internal funding. Apply early. There are deadline dates. You need to meet and exceed those deadline dates. Keep a list of them. I suggest creating a tick list where you put down everything you need to submit, the date it needs to be submitted. You can do this in Excel and sort it by dates. And then as you do them, check them off and you know that it's done. Very important you meet those deadlines because every time you miss a deadline date, you're throwing money away. Remember that the FAFSA itself opens on October 1st. 
and you can ben, begin completing it at that time, it'll be using the 2020 tax information. So the sooner you get to it, the better. A lot of people say, oh, but that's gonna take so long. The average family completes the document in the first round in approximately 36 minutes. That's a US Department of Education statistic. And then after that, once you know it, it goes faster. Uh, so remember, get that started as soon as you can. And follow up, if you send us something, make sure we get it. You do not know how many times we have received empty envelopes from parents. They thought they mailed us something. I had a lady call me one day just irate that we had not received her son's information. And I kept telling her, she was faxing it to us. I kept telling her, ma'am, we don't have anything from you. Well, that day I'd received a batch of blank paper about like this. She'd been faxing upside down. And so we were getting blank pages. And that's okay, people do that. New fax machines, never used it before. How many of you have used new technology and didn't know what you were doing? Happens to me every day right now. So we, we work with people like that. Uh, but make sure you keep a copy of everything you send because you can get it to us one way or another. Keep your file active because that means you're moving towards your award and it's moving towards you providing, receiving the information you need to make a decision. Never, 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 regardless of how hard they would beg, send your social security number or your student social security number via email. There are too many people trying to hack college and university sites and steal your identity. Never. You can fax it to them. Uh, you can send it by snail mail, but you cannot send it by email. An absolute no-no. And the Department of Edu Education tells schools not to ask for it that way, yet I know people who still re ask students to send it by email. Don't do it. You risk your, uh, your financial security. And communicate. Again, going back to COVID, our financial situations have changed dramatically for a lot of people. I see it on a daily basis. People who had very substantial jobs who are no longer working. And so suddenly that income they had no longer applies because remember, we're looking at prior, prior year. So this year particularly, we were looking at 2019 before the changes occurred. 2020, some of those changes will have occurred, but not to the full extent, possibly. So there's still room to file professional judgment. Ch uh, communicate any changes in the family status from income to family size to one-time income, unusual medical expense, sibling, private, K-12 education, divorce, death, parents in college, any change. It's better to over-communicate than for you to fail to provide us information that could assist you. Make sure you let us know. And watch out for the scams. At any point when somebody says, I will help you do this for this amount of money, just walk away. There are people out there that tell you, well, I'll help you fill in your free application, and if I do, I guarantee you that you will receive federal financial aid. The problem with that is what they're telling you to do is commit fraud. And we do punish people who commit fraud. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the areas we see a lot of fraud in on our campus and other schools are beginning to see it now, they just didn't realize it. It's when students file appeals, they submit documents that are, they say they're from a doctor and they're not. Now you catch them a lot of times because of the grammar itself. Uh, the way we found it the first time, and this has been a number of years ago, a young man applied for an appeal saying that he had been going to the doctor with back issues. He submitted his doctor's note, we looked at it, and the young man submitted a doctor's note from an OBGYN. 
We called the OBGYN and the response was, I do not treat male patients. So that's how we first ran into it and we've pursued it since. But anybody who wants to charge you, push them aside. Say, no thank you. You have free resources available to you. Tips for completing the FAFSA. This is to get you started. First thing you want to do is gather your tax documents. Uh, you're using prior, prior year data, so you're using 2020. Then read the instructions. Read the instructions. I promise you, if you read the instructions, you're going to be fine. I always remind everybody of when you were in school, mom and dad, and the teacher handed out that piece of paper and she said, read every question on the form and do exactly what it says. And about three quarters of the way down, it said, if you've read this far, put your name on the paper and turn it in. Now, I'm not going to ask how many of you were already answering questions. But that was the idea behind it. Same thing here. Just read the instructions. And then follow what they tell you to do. Don't try to overinterpret or underinterpret, but just do what they tell you to do and check your work. I was filling in a form today, and it's a federal form, and it's, it's not the easiest form in the world to use. And I looked down, and I'd put 12,000 where I wanted 1,200. But I have to go back over every one of those numbers to make sure they're right. It's easy to do that. Uh, you have to complete a new form every year the student's in college. There's rumor that that may not be true moving forward, but we're waiting to see. Uh, the 22-23 application opens on Friday. So that could be a good Friday night party around the house. Pop some popcorn and complete the FAFSA. What an exciting Friday night, right? It's a good family activity. So keep that in mind. Students are dependent until the age of 24 for financial aid purposes. The circumstances under which a student can be considered independent are limited and none of them are good. You don't want to even try to go there because they've given us very strict guidance. But they moved out of the house and they're making their own money and they have their own apartment and yeah, nope, that doesn't work. Well, we've had a big fight with them. You don't know how many students I've told, got to suck it up, go home, make good with your mom and dad because you need their information. They're in control. So it's very limited circumstances. Divorced parents who are remarried are considered married. The step-parents information will be included on the form. The non-custodial biological parents information will not be included on the form. Unmarried parents living in the same household must include both incomes. When parents are divorced, the parent with whom the student resides for a majority of the year is the par parent responsible for completing the FAFSA, regardless of who claims them on their taxes. So if they live with parent A for 50.1% of the year, that is the parent who completes the FAFSA, inclusive of if they've remarried the step-parent's information. If it's an exactly a 50-50 living arrangement, then it would be the parent who claims them on their taxes. That's very rare. It's usually one or the other. But if it is exactly 50-50, then it's the parent who claims them on their taxes. If that's still not clear, because remember in the Tax Reform Act of, I believe, 1997, it said the students could claim themselves and not be claimed by a parent. Well, if that is the case, logic would prevail. You would use the parent with the lowest income. So that's where you go with that. Sort of a roundabout way. Um, dependent students who receive supplemental Social Security income, this almost never happens, but I have to tell it to you. Those Social Security benefits would be included under the parent section if they're taxable. So that's the thing to remember. If at all possible, and it should be, file your taxes file to, uh, prior to completing the form because it's 20, uh, 2020 taxes. 
you should have already filed them because on October 1st, the deadlines, except in a very few circumstances, have passed. Uh, I've already told you about the information that, well, I didn't change those numbers right there. I thought I caught all of them. My apologies. That should be 2020 and 2223. I went through this and updated everything and missed that, and I was adding things as I went. Estimate taxes if you have to. You should be able to use your regular filed taxes, and you should be able to uh, use the IRS data retrieval tool if you are married and filed a joint return. If you're married and filed separately, you will not be able to use it this year. But I think as of next year, you will. They're making modifications at the Internal Revenue Service. For the first time, it's not a delay at the U.S. Department of Education. It's at the Internal Revenue Service. So we're waiting on them to give clearance on that. Just as a point of reference, and I didn't put this in here, when you use the data retrieval tool, you will get back all X's for your income. Do not let that scare you. It's a identity protection issue that they implemented a couple of years ago. Little confusing to the parents, but we actually get the correct information. The other sort of downside to that is they've told us we cannot release that information to you by phone, that you have to appear in person with a, uh, a government ID. They put all kinds of restrictions on us, folks. So we don't make up the ideas. Same thing. Mom and Dad, make sure your kids file a Federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act waiver for us to talk to you, because otherwise you're going to call and we're going to say, we can't talk, because they become immediately uh, independent for those purposes when they arrive on our campus. So make sure you file that or we won't be able to talk to you. Okay. Only the biological or adoptive parents should complete this form. Only the biologic or adoptive parents should complete this form. If you're the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle, the cousin, uh, the good friend who the student has lived with, you are not responsible and cannot complete this form. If the student was adopted at 13 years of age are older, they're automatically independent. So you would not have to include any of your information. Had a lady, I uh, did a financial aid night for Bishop Snyder, had a lady come up and she said, I adopted my daughter at 12 years and nine months. She missed it by one month. She said, I wish I could have gotten the money. She said, I wouldn't do it any different, but I wish I had. Remember to sign the form. You need to do it electronically because if you submit the form on paper, instead of taking three days, it's going to take three to five weeks. Do you think they want you to use the electronic signature? I can promise you they do. They don't want any paper at the Department of Education. And then if you need help, ask. Don't be afraid to ask. You're going to have my contact information and the counselors here at Bishop Kinney will tell you I take calls every year from parents from Bishop Kinney. If I don't have the answer or you're going to a school that you need specific information about, if I know someone there, I make calls for people and I talk to them. So I'm a resource available to you. The best way is to usually email me and then we'll set a time to talk. I do Zoom meetings this day, these days as requested so that we can look at things if we need to. And it's for your kid going to any school in the country, so don't worry about that. Okay, so you know you can get help. Sources of help, don't forget the college or university your son or daughter is going to attend is an excellent resource. The U.S. Department of Education uh, offers help online. And then the 4 Fed Aid number is a way to get additional assistance. Get the assistance. It's free. Use it as needed. Okay, now we're going to take a quick walk through the beautiful, and I don't know what the Pantone is this year. They don't tell us that anymore. I want to make sure I do this right. Uh, nope, I did that wrong. I want to go to the form now. Oh, that's it. That's it. 
I, I knew that. The first part of the form are the instructions that you can read. And then we come to the form. And the form, the whole first section is directory information. Name, address, telephone number, social security number, date of birth, uh, their driver's license number. If your son or daughter doesn't have a driver's license, and these days, a lot of people in this age group don't have a driver's license. It's like I told them, the day that I turned 16, I wanted to be at the driver's license place when they opened up. Now they, they don't seem to care as much. But if they don't get them a state ID, they need that anyway in case they have to fly. So get them a state ID, and you can use that number here. We ask them for the email address they're going to keep. Mom and Dad, your students have a minimum of five email addresses. You may or may not know that, but they do. I promise you. We see it every day. Uh, but use the one they're going to keep. It's usually best not to use one like HotLep777. You want something that looks a little more formal, I can promise you. We asked if they are a U.S. citizen. Very important question. If they are, they need to oval the correct box. If they're an eligible non-citizen, they need to let us know and they need to triple check to make sure they give us the correct alien A number on this form. Because if not, we have to deal with the Department of Homeland Security. Anybody in here ever try to reach them? You talk about an elusive group. Uh, they, they do better at hiding than the CIA, I can promise you. So make sure that you're doing that. Um, we ask the students' marital status. We do have students that are married. We have students that are divorced. This is where they would tell us. Most of the students here, they're just going to be single and that's as far as it goes. We ask them for their state of legal residence. Um, and we ask if they're male or female. Now, this question is the selective service question. I emphasize that because we're no longer using it. Still answer it because it may cause problems if you don't. It used to be that we had to verify that the male students were registered with the selective service. Well, if, any, if you know anything about selective service, they come back and tell you if they didn't register by the time they were, you know, where they require you to register, you can't deny them federal benefits anyway, so the question was a waste of our time. So as of this year, that question has gone away, except they couldn't get it off the form in time. So it's still there. Um, and then we ask... Um, I'm, I'm trying to read now. Are you male or female? Then the next one is, have you been convicted of a drug crime? All of the students here will answer no. Now let me tell you, this question is also going away. The reason it's going away is because there, we did not have a mechanism to verify the accuracy of the data the student provided. There's no national database that compiles this information and it put the schools and it put the students under a strain to prove or disprove this particular question. Answer it anyway. It's no for everybody here at Bishop Kinney. Next year it will be gone. So this is one of the big changes and the forms, there's going to be more big changes next year. We ask about the education level of the parents. This is to determine if they qualify for uh, first generations funds. When it says college, and they didn't define this well, it should say bachelor's degree or beyond. They're asking if they have a bachelor's degree. If you have an associate's degree, both parents have an associate's degree, you completed the high school level, basically. Um, what will your high school completion date? Uh, it's asking that there. Uh, high school diploma. Will you have a GED? Uh, will you have homeschool? All of them will have a, a diploma from Bishop Kenny. That's the good news. Then we ask what high school they went to. 
and they, we ask them if they'll have their first bachelor's degree before they start school in the fall. Will they have their first bachelor's degree? But people answer that incorrectly with a high level of frequency. The next question we ask is their attendance in school. All of the students, even if they participated in dual enrollment with one of the local colleges, our first year never attended college. Even if they have dual enrollment credits, first year never attended college because those were earned as part of the high school curriculum are not included. Okay, very important. And then we ask what degree they're going to be working on. It's either a first bachelor's degree, an associate's degree, or a certificate. They're not ready to work on professional degrees yet. So skip that one over and move on from there. And then are you interested in being considered for work study? Every student should answer yes to that question. To me, it's one of the finest programs that we offer. The student has a job on campus, generally in an office, and it looks good on their resume, and they get good experience, and they get to know people on campus, people that sometimes can help them. Let me tell you, I was the work-study student to Dr. Francis Kinney at JU for the four years that I was at JU when she was dean. When I graduated is when she became president and she asked me to go to the president's office with her as an assistant to the president. I went there and I ended up staying in higher education, changed my career path altogether, and that's happened to many of my friends. You know, I got to work for a lady whose husband had been a tank commander under Patton, became the American mayor of Frankfurt, he did. She was the first female to earn her PhD from the University of Frankfurt after World War II, American female, and did her dissertation in German. So this is the kind of person I got to work for. You know, we lost her about a year and a half ago now, but I will tell you, I talked to her just a few days before she had her stroke, and this is a lady at 102 who had more of her faculties than most people do in their 60s and 70s, is what I can tell you. And so it was great experience. Your kid could have the same exact experience. Work study is great. Okay, that was step one. How do you feel about step one? Two thumbs up? Easy. Okay, now we did the easy part. Now let's move to the hard part, right? Now I'm really kidding. So understand that if you use the data retrieval tool, about 80% of these questions go away. That's the thing you have to remember. And here's the other thing, just to make this a little easier, so everybody listen to me for just a second. The questions we ask about the student are identical to the questions we ask the parent. So I only have to go through the student's questions because they apply both to the student and to the parent. And that way you don't get to watch grass grow twice, right? Everybody understand that the questions remain consistent. And that's what you need to understand. So let's look at this, and I will move fairly quickly through this, so don't worry. Uh, for 2020, have, you know, the student, have you completed your IRS income tax return? You've either completed it, you will complete it, or you're not going to file. We ask you about the kind of tax return you're going to complete. Well, today, that's mainly just the 1040, right? unless you have a foreign tax return. We ask them the, and this is for the student and the parent, so remember, mom, dad, you're gonna be asked these same questions. We ask the marital status or the filing status, single head of household, married, all of that's there. Did you file, in question 35, uh, did you file, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get the form because one thing you'll find, small print over there is sometimes hard to do and I can move faster if I come over here. Okay, um, did you file Schedule 1? If you didn't, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not a necessity. And then we go on and we ask, 
And I want you to see what happens here because there is a pattern, okay? What was your and spouses, we're asking the student now, but mom and dad, this applies to you, adjusted gross income for 2020. Adjusted gross income is on IRS form 1040 line 11. Leads you right to it. The next question, look at that. We ask about the um, tax amount, 1040, line 22, minus Schedule 2, line 2. If you filed Schedule 2, uh, if negative, uh, enter 0. Tells you exactly how to do it. Again, if you just follow the directions. Then, question uh, 38 through 39. I do consider, excuse me, I do consider this question a little more complex because now, if you filed a joint income tax return, when you did that, you aggregated your, uh, both of your incomes, right? Well, they want it disaggregated. So they ask you to use your W-2 forms. My recommendation is to create a grid, see what they're asking for, and fill in the information you have and total it up. I never liked word problems. I never liked them. My son, he's had advanced calculus, statics, and all of that kind of things. I don't even know what he's talking about mathematically half the time. But he's had all of that, and he understands it and likes it. Word problems, they annoyed me. There were too many words. Well, I had a college math professor tell me, Bill, you've made it too difficult. Put it in a grid. And that's where I get the concept from. I know what's missing if I put it in a grid. Okay, but you can get those disaggregated that way and provide the answers they need. How much did you earn from working in 2020 for the mom and dad, for the student? And then question 40, we move from tax year 2020 suddenly and the form shifts and we ask as of today, as of today, what is yours and your spouse's total current balance of checking, savings, uh, cash savings and checking accounts? Don't include, if the student has financial aid in their account, don't include any of that. But remember, it's as of today. Everybody says, do you want me to do that before or after I pay my bills? Get the net amount after you pay your bills. We don't want an inflated number there. As of today, what is the net worth of your and your spouse's investments, including real estate? Do not include the home you live in. If you have a home here in Jacksonville and a home on Big Lake Santa Fe, you include the home on Lake Santa Fe. Or if you have rental property, you would include that. As of today, what is the net worth of your and your spouse's current businesses and or investment farms? Do not include a family farm are a family business with 100 or fewer full-time or full-time equivalent employees. That eliminates most of the businesses people own. But if you have one with more than 100 employees, calculate it out. It's the value of the business oh, less anything you owe on it. Remember, you take that back out. Okay, now we're going to go to the next page. And we're going to look at... Uh, Additional financial information. These are things that actually reduce your income. Question 43, we ask about education credits, and guess what? We tell you where to find it on the tax form again. You see how easy this becomes when you just look at it and read it? All those big things that you've heard about this being difficult, that was smoke and mirrors. I often say I think the media likes to discourage students from applying by telling them how difficult it is. So don't believe it, it's not difficult. Child support paid, that reduces your income, not what you were supposed to pay, but what you paid. Taxable earnings from need-based employment programs. Uh, all of those are taken back out. We don't look at it. Taxable college grants and scholarships, mom and dad. If you have a son or daughter who receives scholarships that exceed tuition fees and books, they become taxable. That's one of the dumbest tax laws they ever wrote. That discourages students from going out and seeking 
more scholarships. I, I wish they would change it, but I can't do anything about it. I've tried, believe me. Uh, combat pay, that is taken back out. Earnings from work under a cooperative education program, again, reduces the income for either the parent or the student. Question 44, this adds back to what you've had, okay? Payments to tax-deferred pensions or retirement savings plans. I didn't mention this earlier, but this is very important. If you have a pension plan or you have money that you contribute regularly to a retirement program, the corpus, the bulk of that account, is protected. You do not list it as an investment. Though it's a re an approved retirement plan, an IRA, a KEO, a 401k, a 403b, you know, all of the various numbers out there that are approved retirement programs, state pension plan, you don't list those. But what you do list is the amount that you contributed in the current year. So if your plan is worth $100,000 and you contribute $1,000 this year, the only thing that you include here is the $1,000 you contributed in the current tax year. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, IRA deductions and payments to self-employment. Uh, that's all included there. If you pull out of your IRA, this is where you tell us. Child support received, the actual amount received, not anticipated to be received. Tax-exempt interest income from uh, line 2A of the 1040. Untaxed portions of IRA distributions, you tell us about that. Housing, food, and other allowances given to the military or clergy. And so all of those are included. Veterans' edu non-education benefits are also included here. Then other untaxed income. Let me tell you, other than maybe unemployment benefits, really it's hard to get to the point that you have to list anything here. So that's the good news. I will tell you that. And then for the student, we ask and I, money received or paid on your behalf e.g. bills not reported elsewhere on the form. So if somebody's paying your bills, we want to know about that too. Does that sound like the government? Oh yeah, it does. So that, that is the, as difficult as the financial questions get. Like I said, if you just follow the directions, they tell you exactly what to do. And then step three is where we, depend, we determine the dependency status of the student and I think I need to change. No, we're good. Uh, the dependency status of the students, if they answer no to all those questions, they are dependent. If they answer yes to any of those questions, they automatically become independent. Again, most of the students here at Bishop Kenny are going to be dependent. I hate to tell you, Mom and Dad, it's the way it goes. After we finish that, we go to the parent section. Step four, mom and dad, these are the questions that, <coughs> that we ask you. And I'm trying to get to my right page four now. Um, there it is. Um, we're going to ask the parents' marital status. We're going to ask their last name, their social security number, date of birth. Remember, if the parents remarried, we would look at the step-parents information, but not the non-custodial biological parents information. Their state of legal residence, how many uh, in the household size, that helps us determine how much money that we need to set aside for living, and how many people are in college, excluding parents at this point. We ask if they received any of the federal benefits listed in uh, questions 74, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then we go back to the same questions we just went over but this time it's for the parents. Same exact questions. And then, we'll move on again. Then we come, if the student is independent, step five is where they would tell us 
the number in their household and the number in college and if they received any of the federal benefits identified there. Uh, and then we ask the student if they're a dislocated worker. Step six is where they list the schools they want to attend. Make sure they use the correct school code or we'll never get this information. Just as a point of reference, on this form they can list four schools on the electronic version, it's 10 schools. Every year somebody asks me what happens if they have more than 10 schools. You submit the original 10 schools when they come back. That means it's already gone to the school. You make a correction and list any additional schools you want on the form. Then everybody gets the information. It's the way they make us do it. We've argued with them about that too. Step seven is where they told us they uh, tell us they are telling the truth and they're only going to use the money for educational purposes and nothing else. I can assure you if I wanted to be a wealthy man, I know when financial aid disperses and I could have a big semi truck pull up with a bunch of stuff and sell it out in a matter of hours. So the idea is make sure they're using it for educational purposes. At the very bottom there, you'll see a spot for a preparer to fill in. If you paid somebody for help, make sure that they complete that section because as I tell every group, if you go to jail, you want them to go to jail with you, right? I always tell them, I want them in the cell with me. They might not make it out after that. I would have news for you. Okay, and now we're going to, if I can remember how, to, whoops, is it straight up? I don't know why it's, it doesn't like my finger. It took me a while to get used to this too. <laughs> ah, okay, see, so there we go. Changes to the process, remember the forms available Friday. Uh, the DRT process imports about 80% of the financial data, which makes this form really easy. Federal Pell Grant is year round. It used to be limited to fall and spring. They can now get it fall, spring, and summer so they can finish that degree faster. They can do the FAFSA on their phone and it works. That's one of the great changes that they came up with. I was on the committee that worked on that. Took us several years to make it work, but it worked. Selective service and the drug conviction questions are no longer used. When you receive your student aid report, your SAR, check it and uh, you'll receive it by email. Check it for accuracy. Make sure all the schools you're interested in are listed and check with the schools you're interested in to see when they begin issuing award letters and see if you're selected for verification. Last year, in o late October, November, they decided they were not gonna do the main verification group, verification one. We've been told there's the possibility of that happening again this year, but we haven't received notification. Verification is where we ask you for additional documents that you have to provide before we can move forward, such as tax documents. I will tell you that. If the school, when you get your student aid report, get your ICER. The school will check to see if you're selected for verification. If you are, we will notify you of the documents that you need to submit. At the time selected by the school, and if your file is complete, they issue your award letter. Remember, your award letter is your guide to what you're going to receive. It'll tell you the amount of aid you're going to receive. It'll tell you about your aid, your cost of attendance. If you're selected for verification and errors are found, we have to correct them before we can issue an award letter. So this is all going on simultaneously. Uh, if you did not use the IRS match and you're selected for verification, you would be required to submit an IRS 1040 signed wet signature or an IRS tax transcript. If you use the DRT tool, we do not have to ask for those documents. Award letters tells you how much, what kind, and what kind of aid you will receive how to cancel, modify, or reject your award. Again, it's your guide to what you're going to have at that institution. You might receive scholarships, grants, need-based grants, work, loans. Federal Pell Grants go to the neediest students, and those would be supplemented by the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant and the Florida Student Assistance Grant. 
institutional grants usually go to people that don't qualify for the other need-based grants but are still demonstrating need. Scholarships and grants are usually based on academics or talent, uh, have conditions attached, such as you play football or you play in the band. There's a condition attached, or you participate in the honor society, or they go on and on and on, the things that they might require. But remember, scholarships and grants are gift money and do not have to be repaid. We talked about where to find scholarships. Make sure you do that. Work study. If you can get it, take it and enjoy it. Loans. What I will tell you about loans is they're a good tool for financing education, but borrow the lowest amount you can. Do not borrow for lifestyle. Borrowing for lifestyle gets people in trouble. Also, if you're going to borrow, know what field you're going into, know how much it's going to pay, and determine the level of borrowing that is comfortable for you. My daughter is a teacher. She never, uh, fortunately, she never had to borrow. She had the academic scholar. But if she had had to borrow, how much could she afford to repay on a teacher's salary? You have to look at it that way. Think about that before you borrow. If you do borrow, plan on repay. I give you information on the Florida prepaid college plan. It is all accurate. Uh, what I would suggest is that you read through this. Here's what I will tell you about the Florida prepaid college plan. Regardless of the plan you have purchased, if you go to a public institution, there is always a small amount not covered by Florida prepaid, even if you bought the fee payment plan. Everything it pays is statutory. They tell us what we can and can't pay. So just be apprised of that as you move forward. It's a small amount, but it catches people off guard. I did give you multiple slides on this uh, so that you can look at it. Bright Futures, anything that I have here in here on Bright Futures today is subject to change in January and February when the legislature meets. It's most likely wrong at this point. Uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, the medallion, if you go to a public university or a public college, or to a state college rather, it pays 100% tuition now at like Florida State College Jacksonville, uh, at St. John's River, Tallahassee. It's 100% at 75%, and I put that in there wrong at the state university system. It's one of the things that they've done to try to save money in the program. Gold Seal is still at 75%. Bright Future students, if you walk away from a class, you've got to repay the state for that class. That's one of their new rules. And you have to, you have to complete the number of hours you start or you're going to lose your, uh, your award. It's just the way it works. Uh, you cannot use summers to make up deficits. You have to earn everything you start, basically. Uh, let's talk about preparing for the scholarship interview, and this will bring us to the end tonight. If you've applied for scholarships and you're required to go for an interview, make sure you know about the scholarship and the organization offering the scholarship. Answer every question on the application. The one left blank most fre frequently is extracurricular activities. My favorite story on that occurred when I was at JU and I had a young man come for a scholarship interview. He left it blank and I asked him, what are your extracurricular activities? He said, I don't have any. And I sat there a second. I said, okay. I said, what do you do on Friday nights? He said, well, on Friday nights I go up to the, what used to be the old Normandy Mall and I talk to some friends in the parking lot. I said, okay, what do you do on Saturday nights? Well, I do the same thing. You know, my first response was, uh, kid, go through those double doors. There's a theater in there. You might be able to go see a movie. But I listened to him, and I questioned him more, and I want to tell you what he told me, but I'm going to put it in my words. How's that? Some friends of mine and I have formed an informal truck club 
We meet together on Friday and Saturday nights to review the modifications we made to our truck, look at the latest truck literature that's available, and discuss the options we have in preparing our trucks moving forward. Our common interest has created a camaraderie where we enjoy spending time together and we've created this informal club. Now, which sounds better? I stand in the parking lot talking or we created an informal club. Both are true. It's just that one has a better impact. Never use a prepared essay. We don't even have to have as much knowledge as we used to on literature because we run them through computers. Practice for the interview. Mom and dad, get the, used to, I used to tell them, get the camcorders and all, get your phone and record them doing interviews and see what their idiosyncrasies are to help them prepare. White knuckle syndrome. Guys always rub their pants leg. If they come home with a hole, you'll know why. It's called friction. Females invariably twist hair and rings. All of these things. See where you are so you can work those out. You always want to be able to answer your questions honestly and be able to justify your answer. At the collegiate level, we're looking people who can stand for people that can stand on their own two feet and be able to justify the opinion they have. And remember, at the collegiate level, they often ask questions that are a little controversial. Stand on what you believe, justify what you believe. Know your strengths and weaknesses. Know your likes and dislikes. No current events. My recommendation is read current events from multiple perspectives so you can articulate what you believe and why. You know, I, I'm one of those people, I read multiple news sources because I don't want anybody telling me what I believe. I just want them telling me the facts. And it's the way I do it is reading all of them and then I generally find the center ground. They'll, Students need to do that so they can talk about views that they agree or disagree with. That helps them. Dress conservatively. This is not the time to prove your knowledge of avant-garde dress. Just doesn't work well. Uh, you know, most of the people doing this interviews, these interviews are older and they are distracted by some of the modern things that our children do. So just keep that in mind. I, I remind, I tell everybody there was a young girl who came again at JU for a scholarship interview and it was in the punk rock era and she had her hair plastered on the top of her head like a rooster's comb. You would have had to see it. Well, she lucked out and she interviewed with one of the members of my scholarship team and he was a Marine Corps major in the ROTC unit. And I never will forget going back into the room and standing there and came to her name and I said, Major, what did you think of her? And he looked at me and he was shaking his head. He said, you should have seen her hair. You should have seen her hair. She didn't do anything wrong and she was a very bright girl. She ended up getting a good scholarship, but she distracted the interviewer. And instead of paying attention to the answers she was providing, he was looking at an appearance issue. Had a young girl sitting right here in front of me at a, one of these seminars years ago, and she said, that's not fair. And I told her, I said, no, it's not fair, but it's fact. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to try to help you get the scholarship. I always tell everybody, you can't help it if you're ugly, but you can help how you package the ugliness. When you go home tonight, get you a box and go out in your yard and get a rock and put it in there and put it in some wrapping paper and it looks pretty good, doesn't it? How you package yourself makes a difference. We had a young girl on our campus at TCC uh, and, and I'm not trying to be mean, but she was a very homely girl and she dyed her hair for attention bozo red. And she attracted attention, but I could walk through the building and I could see other students looking at her and talking about her. She was getting attention, but not the attention she wanted because they were laughing at her and they were pointing at her. So what I'm saying is go in 
assuming that it's going to be a conservative group looking at you and be prepared. Okay, remember, this is from Dr. Derek Bach, former president of Harvard. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. That quote hangs over the door to my office uh, in T at TCC. The average college graduate will make $1.5 million more in a lifetime when they earn their bachelor's degree. Education is the best investment your sons and daughters will have. I can promise you that. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Or did I tire everybody out? Yes, ma'am. No, what I said, the Medallion Scholar at state colleges, which include schools like Santa Fe, uh, Central Florida, Indian River, uh, Florida State College, Jacksonville, when you're at a state college, it pays 100% of tuition. At the four-year public institutions, the big schools, it pays 75%. Nope, that's 100% if you have the academic scholar. And then it pays 100% at uh, public colleges and universities. They did that for the community colleges because it was a way to save money in the program. Because our tuition is about half of the state universities. Any other questions tonight? You've been a good audience. You stayed awake. I always like it when audiences stay awake. Yes, ma'am, here in the back. Now, I think I understood you. These masks cause a little bit of... Oh, you have a federal ID. It should still be active. You may have to reactivate it, but it should still be active. If you have a federal ID, uh, it... It's been more than seven years since we went to the federal ID from the federal pen, so it should still be good. If not, it's very easy to get it. I don't know. See me afterwards, and I'll try to walk you through that. Yes. Yes, sir. Right here. Depends on the school. Uh, each school has a different time frame. Just to give you an idea, private universities will probably let you know between December and January. Public four-year institutions between January and February. Community colleges somewhere around May. We're sort of the uh, hold off because so many of our students apply late. So, right, of the senior year. Okay, other questions? He has one right. My wife is so sure that she's got a uh, federal ID. She filled out the form for uh, her daughter several years ago. Uh huh. How do we know this two guys? Because she's two guys. Do you remember what the number was? If you've still got it somewhere, just try using it. If it doesn't work, just reapply. That's the easiest way. I would have to look at it and, and, you know, that's, but you shouldn't have any trouble. Just put it in. If it doesn't work, it's easy to go in and apply for a new one. Anybody else? Well, thank you tonight. You've been great. I'll be around at the end if you have private questions and be happy to help you.